pleasure to introduce Ted Von Hippel, uh, who's been a friend of mine for many years now. And uh, he got his undergraduate degree at Dartmouth College, graduate degree from University of Michigan. He did uh, postdoctoral work at Cambridge University, University of Wisconsin. He worked at the Gemini Telescope as a staff member for a while. Um, he was a research scientist at the University of Texas for several years. Most recently, just this past fall, he came to Embry-Riddle University and look forward to hearing your talk, Ted. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. And thanks everybody for um, showing up, being here. You don't need to clap at this point. I haven't done anything yet, but thank you very much. Um, so what I want to do is tell you a story today that is a little bit complicated and has some parts to it. Um, probably many of you have heard um, about the ongoing NASA efforts to find life perhaps on Mars, microbial life perhaps on Mars, past life. How many people have heard something about that before? Okay, awesome. And perhaps some of you have heard about efforts to search for life elsewhere on planets going around other stars. How many people have heard something about that before? Okay, so my talk is more related to the latter one. Um, and it forms a basis of how do we understand how many planets are out there and what they go through. The other thing that it's connected to is what will happen to the Earth and the solar system. So um, I titled my talk The Death of Stars because I'll talk a little bit about that and planets, the late stages. Not everything, nothing lasts forever, um, uh, even, even stars. So, there's multiple motivations for doing this work, but I, what I want to do is motivate this in the sense of trying to understand planets and ultimately uh, trying to look for life elsewhere as a motivation. There are multiple motivations, though. Um, I'm going to be talking about a type of, you could call them dead stars, that are white dwarfs. How many people have heard of white dwarfs before? Okay, awesome. So I'll do a little bit of introduction on that, and I'll talk about the parts of that that matter uh, the most from... Um, the perspective of this research, um, but many of you have heard about them already. That's great. Now there's a class of white dwarfs that have metals in them. So then I'll go into a little bit of detail about that. Um, and we'll, we'll, this was a mystery. We'll talk about the mystery a little bit. Then I'm going to talk about another type of white dwarf, maybe another type, which has more infrared light than people expected. I'll connect the two and then I'll bring them back to um, how planets get destroyed and what happens in the end. Um, okay, so one of the missions that we hope to get in the future, we the whole community of astronomers, is something that we now call the terrestrial planet finder. Terrestrial, uh, a planet like the Earth. Um, and we want that machine to be able to do, that telescope, is to take spectra, I'll talk more about spectra in a little while, but take spectra of an Earth-like planet going around another star. If it could do that, it could potentially <clears throat> find signatures for life um, on a very distant star, the prob on a planet or on a very distant star. The problem with that is that planets are very faint compared to their star. So this is the optical. Blue would be over here, red here. This is going into the infrared. And this is how bright it is. And this is on a logarithmic scale. So the Earth is this bright in the visible and near infrared, and the sun is a billion times brighter in the um, optical. The infrared isn't so bad. The sun is, and typical stars are falling off in the infrared, and actually planets get a little brighter in the infrared, but that's still down by six orders of magnitude, a million or more. So <clears throat> the eventual mission, the mission we're hoping for, has to have some exquisite optics to deal with this, because what this means is you have to find a planet very close to, because they always are close to, their host star. And the host star is a million to a billion times brighter and you still have to be able to study the planet, like studying a firefly right next to a giant commercial spotlight. Very, very difficult and we need some special optical techniques to suppress this giant uh, spotlight so we can study the firefly. Um, so that's leading towards a technology drive um, and there's two possible, in the broadest sense of the word possible, architectures or technologies people are talking about. Uh, these are just pictures, cartoons of what they might look like. Um, one is called an optical coronagraph. And you all are familiar with coronagraphy at some level, although we might not have used that word. 
Um, when you go outside and the sun is shining in your face and you want to see something, uh, a football being thrown at your head or a bird, you put your hand up and you block the sun. And you block a little zone around there, and if the football is coming from exactly that direction, you have no chance. But you can see near it, and you can see up in the sky. We need to block the light. That's one way to do it. We have something a little better than your hand uh, in the way of the star, um, but it needs to be done uh, exquisitely. Uh, the other way, that's in the optical. The other way is in the infrared. Um, you can get constructive and destructive interference with the waves of light. Now, I won't talk about that too much. We can talk about that more later if you want. Um, this is harder um, from an astronomy point of view or from an engineering point of view to make a single telescope, but this one actually requires for the constructive destructive interference a fleet of telescopes all observing the same thing and then combining the wavelengths later. And NASA has not yet form done formation flying for spacecraft, so they don't know how to do that yet either. So there's two very difficult technologies. Um, probably either one could be done in the vicinity of five to ten billion dollars um, and they will eventually be done um, but they're very difficult. Now one of the parameters in this is how big do we make these telescopes? In order to know how big we have to make these telescopes we have to know how far away the nearest stars are with Earth-like planets that we care about and so we need to try to figure out how common planets are. That's the underlying motive that connects into my research and what I'll be talking about tonight. This is a NASA graph. It's a little uh, complicated, but this would be one. Here, my one got covered somehow. Um, that would mean every star in the sky has an Earth-like planet. This here would be one-tenth of all stars in the sky have Earth-like planets. And this would be every star in the sky has 10 Earth-like planets, which is not going to happen. Um, the real answer is anywhere from up in here on down. And NASA has a mission right now, the Kepler mission, which many of you may have heard about, um, that its fundamental goal is actually to find how probabilistic, how, like, how common planets are, so where on this axis we are. Because this axis determines how many stars we can study and ultimately the cost and how long this will take. This axis is how many we're going to find. So there's, um, if you do a mission that looks at 25 stars, um, you have, uh, unfortunately, still um, an 80% chance here of not finding anything. If you do a mission that looks at 150 stars, you only have a 20% chance of not finding anything. But you want, if you're going to spend 5 or $10 billion, to have a very high probability that you're going to find something. So you can either look at more and more stars so that the probability of failure goes down, um, or you can get lucky and nature can make uh, more and more stars to begin with. You want a low curve. And so many of us are working on where along this axis are we? How common are planets or terrestrial planets, Earth-like planets? Okay, so let me give a little bit of introduction to white dwarfs, um, uh, even though uh, it sounds like many of you, most of you have heard of them. How many of you are familiar with the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram? Okay, so this is our most common way of, of encapsulating or looking at stellar evolution. Um, on this diagram, we plot the temperature of stars or a proxy for temperature. Now, because of the history of astronomy, people were making this plot before they knew what they were plotting. Um, it's plotted backwards. Uh, normally, we would plot the big number to the right, the small number to the left, but we astronomers do it the other way around. So 100,000 degree stars over here and 3,000 degree stars over there. These are the temperatures of the surface of the star. This is what we see, not the temperature at the center of the star. This is how bright the star is, um, and it's also in these uh, logarithmic units. The sun is about 5,000, 6,000 degrees Kelvin, um, and it's by definition one, one times the brightness of itself, one solar luminosity. But stars can be um, um, 10,000 times brighter or 100, 100th as bright. And most stars lie along a sequence here uh, that's the most common, called the main sequence. Now, our sun in this diagram, so this is not a physical space, this is a parameter space, this is a measurement space. Our sun will, in five billion years, it's been around for four and a half, in five billion more years, approximately, I can't tell you Tuesday at three o'clock or something like that, but it will stop doing what it's doing now. It'll run out of hydrogen in the center. And that will, for some complicated reasons, cause the core to shrink, but the whole star to expand. 
And as a consequence, the surface will get cooler, but the overall thing will get much brighter. Uh, it'll go on doing some stuff for a while. Um, eventually, it'll blow off most of its outer layer. The sun will blow off about ha half its mass. And it will quickly transition across the top of this diagram, meaning it'll go from being a red giant, it'll blow off its outer layers, and we'll see the core of the star as a very hot, 100,000 degree, very luminous object, which no longer has any um, fusion, any power going on, so it'll just cool like a rock um, pulled out of the fire. Uh, this to the right is cooling, and cooling makes it fainter and uh, colder. So uh, for those of you who've seen the HR diagram, it might help. If you haven't, um, uh, don't worry about it. Just puts it in context for people who are familiar with that. Now, most every star will become a white dwarf. Um, this box encapsulates the range of stars that will become a white dwarf. Stars more massive than this will either blow up completely and there'll be nothing left over, or they'll leave a neutron star, um, or they'll leave a black hole. Stars less massive than this will evolve to something eventually, but the universe is not old enough for them to have done anything yet. The universe is 13.7 billion years old, and they take too long. When a star um, starts to become a white dwarf, it goes through this stage called a planetary nebula. This stuff is the gas used to be the surface of the star being blown off. And you can see it's kind of being blown off in multiple episodes. It's not one uh, giant explosion. It's sort of uh, like a giant wind or series of, of, uh, of ejections. This is the core, the object that will become the white dwarf. Now, we've never taken a resolved picture of a white dwarf. White dwarfs are just dots on all of our um, uh, pictures. So I have to use the beauty of PowerPoint to show you what we think a white dwarf looks like on the inside. Uh, most white dwarfs look like this, not all. Um, they are 99% uh, um, let's say uh, a combination of carbon and oxygen. Um, on top of that, uh, this, uh, I don't know what color that is, but off-white color represents a layer of helium um, that is about 1% of the star. And on top of that, they have a thin layer. It's yellow, but it's so thin you can't even see it in this plot that represents a um, uh, hundredth of a percent. That's what white dwarfs do. Now, they do this for a funny reason, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, so I, I'll first introduce the observations, then I'll say what's funny about it. Um, white dwarfs with metals. Now, what is a metal? A metal to an astronomer is anything other than hydrogen or helium. Um, now, you may not think of oxygen as a metal. You probably don't. Um, you may not think of nitrogen as a metal. They're just gases. But in the lingo of astronomy, we tend to simplify things. And everything other than hydrogen and helium has about the same effect on a lot of the things we care about. So the periodic table, you've all learned the periodic table. You've learned the periodic table. You've learned the periodic table. Maybe not yet. Um, the periodic table has hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. No. For astronomy, hydrogen, helium, metal. That's it. So it's a little bit simpler. <clears throat> I should teach your class, huh? Okay. So what happens? Well, as you know, um, you can take white light and stick it through a prism and divide it up into its constituent wavelengths. Rainbows are this, but through water. Um, blue to uh, red. Now, when we do that for a star, um, we get a lot of information. Um, this is a white dwarf. So we've divided it up from blue. I just tilted the prism on its side. We divided it up from blue to red, and this goes into the infrared where the human eye can't see, but there's still light there. And if it were a light bulb, we would just get something smooth. If it were an incandescent light bulb, we would just get something smooth. But because this object has hydrogen in its atmosphere. The surface has a little bit of hydrogen on it. Hydrogen absorbs out light here. You can see there's less light there. So this is the color, and this is how, how much of it there is. So there's a little bit of missing red light there, a little bit of missing, I don't know, green light there, and there's some more missing other bits of light. Um, we can analyze this carefully. We can figure out what's there. Every element in the periodic table has a different signature this way, and so we can tell what's there and how much of it. We learn a bunch of other stuff too. Uh, but in this particular case, you see hydrogen. Now, if you blow up, I'm going to blow up a little section right here. 
If you blow up a little section, then you see those big absorption things from hydrogen. There's a little tiny absorption there. It would otherwise just go over the top. Um, and that, in this case, is due to calcium. Almost every star that we observe has calcium in it. The sun has a gigantic amount, very visible. Um, uh, but the white dwarf has calcium. It also has some of this other stuff, magnesium, iron, silicon, aluminum. Um, why is that weird? Well, the thing that's weird about it um, is uh, related to this. Um, if I stick Newman's, I'm sorry, he's a little, Newman got a little blurry. Um, if I stick a, a bottle of Newman on the table, um, we get some, I don't know what that is at the bottom, but you know, it's oil at the top and the balsamic and whatever at the bottom. It differentiates by density. How long will it settle? How long does it take to settle? Well, you have dinner, you put it down, and a little lady, you want to put a little more salad dressing on, like, oh, I got to shake this up again, right? It doesn't take very long. It takes a few minutes, I don't know, uh, to settle. Um, this is because this stuff has a higher density than this stuff. Now, this is happening in the Earth's gravitational field. Gravity is causing this to happen. Um, uh, for a white dwarf, the gravity is severe. The gravity on a white dwarf is about 10,000 times stronger than the gravity on the sun. I don't know how much stronger it is on the Earth because I haven't done that comparison, but um, anyway, it's very, very strong. And so if I look at the atmosphere, what ends up happening is these red dots are meant to be little blobs of um, iron, magnesium, silicon, whatever, any kind of metal. Anything heavier than um, hydrogen, which is on the very top, um, and it's also going to be heavier than helium, will just sink because of gravity. The same reason why your, your salad dressing settles out, the surface of a white dwarf settles out. The gravity is extreme, and so um, a metal atom is, <coughs> is uh, denser, and it sinks. How long before these metals disappear? Well, these metals disappear, it depends on the details on the star, but they disappear in about, uh, often case, a couple of weeks. Now, astronomy is not a story of a couple of weeks. Astronomy is typically the story of a billion years, billions of years. These white dwarfs, some of them are billion years old, some of them are, are young, and they're only 100 million years old. Some of them are 5 billion years old. How is it that they can have something that we can observe in its surface when the gravitational settling theory, which is pretty straightforward, uh, tells us that it should be gone in a matter of weeks. Well, back in the um, 80s, I remember going to my first white dwarf meetings, and there would always be somebody who had a poster up on the wall talking about metals in the white dwarfs. And most of us would just go right by the poster, so this is kind of weird, we don't really know what it, the reason is, it's kind of weird we pass by. Maybe if we're, you know, holding our beer and we can't simultaneously do three things, we'll talk to them about their metals. But um, most of us thought this was pretty strange and we didn't know how to put it in context of anything else we knew, and so we didn't do much with it. Um, okay, so this is a strange, strange story. Um, however, in the mid-90s, uh, our community found that one-third of all the white dwarfs have metals. So if something's really strange and you notice this scientifically and you can't explain it, but only one out of a million are doing it, okay, so what? There's some weird story you haven't figured out and one out of a million are doing it. But if one-third of all whatevers are doing it, there's got to be a straightforward explanation. It's got to be able to happen over and over and over again. And in fact, we only know that one-third are doing it. If one-third are doing it, it's possible the other two-thirds are, and we just haven't noticed it. So now we got a problem. Okay. Let's hold that story, let's hold that problem in our head. That's what a white dwarf is. Some of them have metals in their atmosphere. It's a bizarre thing. Uh, let me tell you about white dwarfs with excess infrared light. And maybe that's another mystery. It wasn't a mystery for very long. But um, uh, let me start with this. And this is a scientific uh, uh, result. So I've taken it directly from the literature. I wouldn't expect you to um, understand it or interpret it right away. But this line, so this is, th th and everything's, I keep flipping the axes on you, and I'm sorry about that, but this is the way it was published. It's published in Journal Nature. This is the optical. This is about how your eye sees. This is in the red just past where your eye sees, and this is getting into the infrared further and further. So this is a wavelength axis. Um, uh, and this is the intensity, how much light there is. So in this plot, what this white dwarf should have done if it was behaving itself properly, like other good, decent white dwarfs, is it should have fallen off like that. As the observers look further and further in the infrared, 
they should have seen less and less and less light. But instead, what it did is this. The big lines represent an uncertainty, an error bar. So they're very certain about these data, less certain about those. But anyway, you can tell this was not a well-behaved star. It had a lot of excess infrared uh, that was not expected, um, way, way above the models. Now initially when this was found, these guys were looking for planets around white dwarfs. And they thought they might have found a planet because a planet emits primarily an infrared. You'll remember that the Earth is actually brighter uh, uh, compared to the sun in the infrared than it is in the visible. It's not brighter than the sun, but relatively speaking, it's brighter in the infrared. So they thought maybe a planet was around um, this white dwarf. And that's what they were, uh, that's what they were motivated to search for. Um, so there were a bunch of papers, that was in the early 90s, there was a bunch of papers on that um, getting some interpretation. And we, we knew what it was. I'll tell you what it was in a moment. Before I tell you what it is, um, this is a data set that we got I can't remember the year anymore, but let's say 2005. Um, this was after the Spitzer Space Telescope flew. So the Spitzer Space Telescope is this fantastic infrared telescope that NASA launched, I don't know, 2004, 2003? I don't remember when it was. And um, these are the data we had before in the optical. So here's now um, blue, green, red, near infrared, further in the infrared. And again, this is how bright it is. So this white dwarf, was like this in the ultraviolet, like this in the optical. We knew that all along, and it should have done this. So this is the previous plot flipped left to right, although made, uh, you know, I, I think it's a better plot because I made it. Um, we observed it in the infrared. We got these data, that data, that data, that data, and then in fact, we got a spectrum. And so not only did it have this excess here, but on top of the excess, it had a big peak, this extra flux here. And what all of this told us is that this white dwarf was surrounded by dust. Um, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to look at that peak. Just isolate that peak. Now, if I isolate just that peak, that peak is here. It's at about 10 microns, which is way out in the infrared. Um, I'm going to show you dust from different environments and compare. So this is the spectra of dust. This is how dust behaves if you gather, if you look at dust, that's between the stars from the interstellar medium. Uh, this is how dust behaves from a particular star, Myra, which is, blowing, which is in the late stages of being a giant, blowing off um, uh, dust. This is how the dust looks from comet Hale-Bopp, which uh, comets are, are snowballs, but they have a lot of dust in them. And this is how dust uh, looks in our solar system. Zodiacal light is just little bits of dust scattered throughout our solar system. So, <clears throat> which of these does our uh, white dwarf look the most like? Okay, I hear zodiacal, I hear all of them. It depends on the angle. If you're at a high angle to the screen, you might not be able to see it very well, but it's got a pretty flat top. I think I'm either losing my thumb or I'm losing the... Um, it's got a pretty flat top. The, three, the next two are peaked to the left, Hale Bop is a little bit flat, but then peaked to the right. And the zodiacal light is the closest thing to it, um, looking um, quite flat on the top there. Um, so, what we know without doing any theory is that um, this looks a lot like dust in our solar system and what we're seeing around there. Now, we did a lot more, we did a lot more than that. Um, this is looking at um, the, the white dwarf part has been subtracted. This is just looking at the disk as well as. The, um, the peak I just showed you, and we fit models to it, and we find out that it's something called amorph mostly something called amorphous olivine. Now I'll show you a picture of some amorphous olivine. The green sand beach um, on the south coast of the Big Island of Hawaii. Don't know if any of you seen it. Anybody seen the green sand beach? Okay, two of you, I say field trip for the rest of you. Um, this is, it's a magnesium rich uh, silicate. The beach is this color. It's not, you know, doctored up. And um, if you uh, pick up some with your hand, uh, that's what the um, what the grains of uh, sand look like. Um, so it's a it's a particular silicate that is SiO2, what's quartz, um, but it has a lot of magnesium in it, and that's what makes it green. Uh, turns out uh, that this is a highly refractory. Um, silicate, meaning 
It has one of the highest melting temperatures of any rock, any silicate, any quartz. Now, this is what we think the whole system looks like. So up at the top in the middle is the white dwarf um, and this yellow stuff going around. Now this was, we had a NASA support for this, so NASA issued a press release and they got an artist for us and the artists have great imagination um, and they drew the, the artist drew this and in this case there's a big chunk of something coming in, we'll call it part of an asteroid or a comet, we'll talk about that later, um, and a bunch of dust sprinkled around and this artist drew the disc thin enough so you can see through and you see the background stars. Um, at the same time we were making this discovery, um, there was a competing team um, uh, that was doing the same thing on different stars and they had an artist. Um, their artist um, drew it like this. Uh, also, you know, we know there's a white dwarf in the center, that's their conception of what a white dwarf looks like. The disc is getting very close to the white dwarf in both cases. Their artist put more rocks in there um, and their disc is thicker, you can't see through it, but we don't actually know whether you can see through the disc or not. We just know there's a lot of dust and it's going around uh, the white dwarf. Might be bigger chunks, might be smaller chunks. Might be more, might, might be less. Oh, and their artist added a beautiful planet that, other than being green, looks a lot like Jupiter. Um, okay, to give you a sense of scale, we do know the size of these things. This is about the size. So a white dwarf, although it was the core of a star, um, is very small. This white dwarf is a little more massive than the, uh, than the sun will become. It's actually smaller than the Earth. Um, and the size of the disk is about the size of Saturn uh, and its rings. Um, and this mark here is that for this particular disk, we expect it to be uh, sublimation means converting directly from a solid to a gas. So in space, we rarely get liquids. We either have a solid or a gas. Um, so interior to this point, um, in this particular disk, they vary from one to the other. It's hotter because you're closer to the white dwarf, and so this stuff would be in the gas phase, and exterior to this, um, it would be little grains of dust. Okay, so <clears throat> How do we connect those two stories? One story of metals in um, a star that shouldn't be there, the metals should only last for a few weeks, another story about these um, infrared excesses. Um, all right, well that was the first object uh, we knew about, and that had been found by another group. Once we started doing this, we started looking for many of them, and these are more plots. I'm sorry the spectra all look different. I'm just using research spectra. Um, this is now in the infrared, but again, um, I'm trying to show what they should look like and what they do look like. So this is a star. Um, I'll just do the bottom one. This is, the black line is a star, the red line is a model fit. Um, and what we see is this, but if it were just a star without a disk, it should continue down here. So all of these stars have more light in the infrared uh, than they should. We found a second one, our group found a second one, a third one, the other group's finding more, um, another one. And um, we've taken our group and the other group here um, have taken spectra and the one I showed you before that had this bump at 10 microns that looked like um, uh, the zodiacal light, um, now we've got a whole bunch of them like that. Some are stronger, some are weaker, some are kind of noisy. Uh, this black one here, that's mostly noise, uh, but there's a lot of them. They look like this. The interesting thing is all of the white dwarfs that have these infrared excesses, that have dust going around them, also have metals in their atmosphere. So <clears throat> the story of metals in the atmosphere, um, the stories of metals in their atmosphere is the only way they can have metals in their atmosphere is if, they if the metals landed in the last couple weeks. Well, things don't happen like that in astronomy. Things are very old. So if they have metal in the last couple weeks, it isn't that one third of all white dwarfs just happen to have somebody dump some metal on them in the last uh, you know, a couple weeks. It just doesn't work that way. They have to have metal falling on them continuously. So what's happening is these debris, these, what we call debris disks, these, these dust disks, extend in very close to the star and something is causing the innermost bit of this stuff to rain down on the star. Yes? It might be gravity. Yeah, it might be gravity, but um, it doesn't actually work that way. Um, it gets a little more complicated because the gravity's been there all the time, and so they have what's known as angular momentum. They're spinning around, 
And so the spinning is compensating for that. So there's other more subtle effects. Um, there's a couple of them. We can talk afterwards if you want about what some of them are. We have a couple of ideas, but there's certain things we don't, we don't know in this particular case. Um, okay, now along with our discovery of seeing them as dust, um, another group, a very cool result, found some that were entirely gas. And the beauty of finding some that were entirely gas is when they took spectra, um, they see these double horned profiles. So normally what I showed you was uh, there's a certain amount of light as a function of wavelength and then we get less light, we get absorption. But sometimes in astronomy we see emission, we see more light. And that comes in this case from a hot disk that's giving off light and when you see a double horn profile in astronomy, you know you're seeing rotation. We can go into the details of why, but you can actually measure the velocity of rotation of these things. And they're moving incredibly uh, quickly. They're rotating around at about 1,000 kilometers a second. Um, let me convert that to miles an hour. Um, that would be uh, a million a meter, that would be 2 million miles an hour uh, they're, rot they're spinning. Um, it's a sizable fraction of the speed of light. It's a uh, thirtieth uh, the speed of light. This, these things are going on. Yes. That's the white dwarf spinning. Or the no, that's the around? dust going around the white dwarf. And the reason is, and this goes back to your comment about gravity. The reason is they can get incredibly close. The white dwarf is very small, smaller than the Earth, but it has almost as much mass as the Sun. So that's a very intense gravitational field. So they can get in very close. When you're that close to something with that much gravity, you've got to be moving very quickly to not fall in. So they came in from further out, and on the way in, they just go, start going faster and faster and faster. So they're, they're moving around at you know, a very high velocity. Um, and they had an artist. Um, and their artist drew this picture. Now, we don't know what color it is um, because uh, that particular set of lines that we see is not, um, it's in the infrared. They made it red, but it's in the infrared. The human eye wouldn't see it. There's going to be other things. Probably it would glow um, sort of like the sun does at a range of wavelengths. Uh, we don't know that much about it yet. Um, their artists added some rocks and a moon and some other stuff. But anyway, um, that gives you an idea of what it approximately looks like. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to show you one more <coughs> complicated diagram. Um, most of you who don't follow this at the end don't feel bad. Um, for th some of you who are more into um, uh, had the background in physics, this might help. Um, this is a diagram from some of our papers. Um, and this looks at stars that have these properties. They have metals in their atmosphere. Um, that range from 20,000 degrees Kelvin to 5,000. So the sun's not a white dwarf, but if it were, the sun would be here. These are a little colder, and these would be three times hotter. Um, and then this is how much metal is falling on them. In order to maintain the amount of metal we see today, because it would, it would drain out of the atmosphere in a couple weeks, in order to see the amount of metal we, ha we see in there today, this is how much is falling. So here, where it says six, this is... Um, uh, a thousand, uh, this is a thousand, I converted to kilograms, so this is in grams, but that is a thousand kilograms a second. So that's a ton a second um, of metals falling in, and this would be a thousand tons a second up there of metal falling in. That's how much stuff is falling in at the surface. So somebody is not just dumping a tiny bit of this stuff in, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff falling in. Now the ones that are marked in red or blue at the top of the diagram are ones where we see the disk and we see the metals. The ones that aren't marked in red or blue are the ones where we don't see the disk, but we do see the metals. The disk is harder to see. What this tells us is we're seeing the tip of the iceberg. Only the brightest ones that have the most stuff falling in can we see both. Probably the rest of these also have the disk, but we can't see them. Um, so this is just a way of comparing them. Every case where we have the detective ability to see the disk, or nearly every case, if we see the metals, we see the disk. So we think they're one and the same thing. You have a disk, you have dust around it, it's falling in. Okay, so how is all of this connected to planetary system destruction? What created this thing in the first place? Well, stars don't end quietly. Um, this is Eta Carina, our sun will not do this. Uh, this is a high mass star that's 
going to blow as a supernova. It's not blowing as a supernova now, but it's kind of having a temper tantrum before it becomes uh, a supernova. It's blowing off lots of gas in different directions. Um, however, um, you know, stars do that. Uh, this is a star much like the sun that's made another planetary nebula. I showed you one before. Um, it's blown off gas, and you get the sense that it did it in multiple times because you have, uh, it's not smooth, or it's not just one shell, um, and that's creating the white dwarf um, at the center. Um, there's another one, a um, uh, star there at the center. There's another star, but that's in the foreground or the background, and that's blown off gas in a different, in a different manner. Um, okay, so let's think about our solar system. Our solar system looks sort of like this. There's more stuff in it than this, but Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Okay, Cirrus, that represents the asteroid belt. There's a bunch of asteroids between Mars and Jupiter, between Mars and Jupiter, <coughs> asteroids. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. There's more stuff further out. Something called Pluto and a Kuiper belt, some other stuff. Now, this is not the scale, right? I hope everybody knows that. Um, the circles are to scale. That is, the Sun is that much bigger than the other planets, and they're to scale relative to each other. But the, there's a vast distance separating them, uh, and I can't draw that because the board is just, you know, has to be way too wide uh, to do that. So that's what we have now, although the planets are much, much further apart. Now, at some point, uh, the Sun will become a red giant. Boom. There goes Mercury, there goes Venus, and we're not quite sure, but it probably won't reach the Earth. Now, it won't be nice on the Earth at this point. Um, you'll have a 3,000 degree Kelvin thing nearly in our face. Um, the atmosphere will, will go away. The oceans will boil away. It'll be a baked rock. Um, but that's what will happen in, um, in circa 5 billion years. Yeah, well, humans probably won't even exist on the planet anymore at that point. The time scale for evolution biologically is such that um, nothing that we would recognize, uh, uh, well, some microbes we may, I don't know, the DNA. Alive, <laughs> right, well, you'll be, right, we won't be around anyway, but you'd be, you'd be very dead if you were there. Um, however, that won't take place overnight. The transition from, the transition from this to that takes tens of millions of years. So you have some time to move out of town. Um, right, for instance, that might not be a bad idea. There's some nice moons there. Um, then it blows off the outer layers, and what's left over is a hot little ember white dwarf. Now it's getting a lot cooler. Um, however, um, however um, what ends up happening is there's a lot less gravity in the center of the, of the planetary system. Um, a lot of mass was blown out. And so the gravitational field binding the planets drops. It drops by a factor of two to five, depending on how much mass is lost. So all the planets are drifting out. And they drift out by a factor of two to five. Now that two is supposed to take a while. The drifting out and the mass loss phase maybe take 10,000 years or a little longer. So it's not like they just suddenly escape, but they drift further and further out. So this scale gets even worse because the planets are further out. So if Earth survived that, then Earth moves further out and it gets a lot colder, not only because it becomes a white dwarf, but because it moves further out. Um, now, through mechanisms we don't understand, we have some, there's a couple of scientific papers on this, there's been some studies of this, but there's a lot we don't understand. We think this period, when the planets move further out, destabilize some of the minor bodies in the, in, will destabilize some of the minor bodies in our solar system, and did destabilize minor bodies in these other systems where they're now white dwarfs. And so it, things equivalent to our asteroids, or possibly comets which come from further out, or possibly moons or planets like the Earth, some smaller things get shoveled in. Um, and when they get too near the white dwarf, um, they um, become shredded and they become these debris disks. Now the idea is they don't actually have to become dust before they get to the white dwarf. The gravitational field near the white dwarf is so intense that it has tidal forces that rip rocks apart. 
So just like the moon raises tides in the earth and the earth raises tides in the moon, if you get near a white dwarf because there's so much mass in such a small place, the tides are insane. And if you get within about one and a half solar radii is a technical number, but if you get too close to a white dwarf, even if you're a rock, you get ripped apart into dust. So that's how we think these things are created. Now, to tie this in back to the other searches for planets and all this other stuff, um, there's been very successful programs to look for Jupiter mass planets, um, or very large planets, let's say, um, using something called the radial velocity technique that probably many of you have heard about. And when they make diagrams of what they find, they find, this is the number of planets they find versus how massive they are. So they find a lot of planets about Jupiter's mass, and less and less and less when you go uh, to higher and higher mass. And what they'll say is, about 5 or 10% of all stars in the sky that are like the sun will have a Jupiter mass planet around it, at least, might be more. Um, what we say is all the debris disks are associated with these um, metal lines in their atmosphere. The only way they get metal lines in their atmosphere is because there's dust raining down on them all the time. One third of all white dwarfs have metal lines in their atmosphere. Therefore, one third of all white dwarfs come from systems where there's terrestrial planets and asteroids and stuff like that, and some of that stuff is falling in and being turned into a debris disk. Now, it could easily be 100%, because there could be systems that expand outward enough so that the asteroids avoid uh, getting occasionally tapped and brought back into the center. So our research is saying, and the other team, is saying that at least a quarter or a third of all stars out there that become white dwarfs um, had rocky planets. Now, is white dwarf typical? Yes, 98 or 99 percent of all stars will become white dwarfs. So this is the end state of almost every star. So the end state of, of one third of all stars has dust going around it that looks like um, the south beach of, um, of Hawaii. Um, and what that means is that we're somewhere on the axis about here. We may be even a little higher, where one third of all stars um, have Earth-like planets around them. So the good news is, even if you do a mission with only 25, that's the black line, even if you do a, a terrestrial planet finder mission with only about 25 stars, you've got a very low probability, I don't know, 1% or wherever that black line is, of not finding something good, of not finding Earth-like planets. And I can't guarantee that means life, but not finding, this means there's a 99% chance or better of, if you can do a tw mission for 25 stars, of finding an Earth-like planet, take the spectrum of its atmosphere, and be capable of detecting life. Doesn't mean there will be life, but there's a very good probability that you'd be able to detect it. So that's the good news. Um, what's bad news for Earth, that is we end up sort of smeared around the white dwarf, is good news for finding life. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>